Hi everybody. So today I'd like to introduce to you the distribution functions for bosons and fermions. And this is for physics 3230 and that's thermal physics and we're working from Schroeder's thermal physics text. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to use Gibbs factors and we're going to find the distribution function for fermions first. So what we're going to do is examine the probability of occupation by little n particles in a single state. Now remember the notation that I often use is big N for the total number of particles in the system and little n for that of a single state. And we're going to call the energy of a single state um, epsilon, little epsilon. Okay, and this jives with uh, uh, Schroeder's notation in the textbook. So here, the probability of occupation um, by n particles of a single state is 1 over the grand partition function, um, sometimes I call it funky z, uh, 1 over the grand partition function times the Gibbs factor, which is e to the minus n times epsilon minus mu over kt. And so as a reminder, funky z is my um, grand partition function. Mu is the chemical potential, k and t are Boltzmann's constant and the temperature respectively. I've already defined epsilon and mu. So what we're going to do is we're going to let a single state uh, be defined as a unique set of quantum numbers. Um, so remember that, for example, this is just an example, that if you have an electron in an atom, okay, then there's a set of quantum, number, quantum numbers that describes that electron. For example, it's the uh, N, L, M, L, and M sub S, right? So N is the energy level, L is the orbital quantum number, M sub L is the magnetic quantum number, and M sub S is the magnetic spin quantum number. So that's the four. Now remember that fermions all obey Pauli's exclusion principle. And that states that for fermions that are captured by a single potential well, so all fermions within a single potential well have to have a unique set of quantum numbers. All right. Now, the implications here are that if it's fermions, that what that means is that for any particular state, you're only going to have two choices for the number of particles. It's either going to be not occupied, and n will be zero, or there will be one particle in that state, and that's it, because it's all about you know, a set of quantum numbers being a single state. And so that would be, for example, uh, within an atom, n equals to 1, l equals to 0, ml equals to 0, and m sub s could be plus 1 half for up spin, okay? That's a single state. So it's not the energy level that I'm talking about here. There's degeneracy within the energy level, but there's not degeneracy within a single state. Okay, so... Um, that means that if we're going to do the sum over all our Gibbs factors to find our grand partition function, that it's not going to take us very long because we're only going to have two possibilities, either little n is 0 or little n is 1. So we end up with two terms in our sum for our grand partition function. Now, within this sum, we're going to call a state that is not occupied as having an energy of 0. And then um, if the state's not occupied, little n is also equal to 0. And then if n is 1, then little n is 1, and the energy is epsilon. So that means that if we're summing over all of our Gibbs factors, then we end up with e to the 0, which is just 1. And that's our first term in the sum. And then our second term would be plus the Gibbs factor, e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. So that's it. Those are our two terms in the sum. So we found our um, grand partition function, and um, now to find the average number of particles that occupies each state, which we'll call n bar. Now, this is little n bar. It's the number of particles on average occupying a single state, not the total number of particles in the system, okay? So little n bar for uh, would be the sum over all of our um, probabilities times the number of particles per state. So what that is, um, remember our probability is just our Gibbs factor divided by our grand partition function. Um, now if there's only two choices, 0 or 1, so if n is equal to 0, then summing over n times p of n is just 0 times the probability of 0, which is 0. And then for one state, or one particle occupying a state, we have n equals to 1 times the probability for 1. So the probability for 1 would be um, our Gibbs factor, which is e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt, 
divided by our partition function, our grand partition function, which we found on the previous slide, is um, 1 plus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. Now, what we can do is multiply the top and the bottom of that fraction by e to the plus epsilon minus mu over kt. And if we do that, then on top we get 1, and then on the bottom we get 1 plus e to the epsilon minus mu over kt. And so that's our Fermi-Dirac distribution function. It is the average number of particles that occupies each state um, and is given by 1 over 1 plus e to the epsilon minus mu over kt. All right. So let's discuss this um, distribution function in a little bit more depth. And by that I mean, what does this distribution function look like? And what does it look like for different temperatures? Okay. So let's break it down. Um, this plot here is a little busy. So what I'm going to do first is just uh, focus on the cold state. And if it's cold, then what we'll say is that kT is equal to our chemical potential mu divided by a relatively big number. Here in the plot, it's 100, but it could be 1,000 or whatever. Okay, so kT is mu over 100. So then we're going to focus on two cases, when epsilon is a lot less than mu and when epsilon is a lot greater than mu. And we're going to look at the extrema. And then we'll look at the middle case. Okay, so here we go. If we have uh, kT is equal to mu over 100, and if we have um, epsilon is a lot less than mu, or epsilon over mu is a lot less than 1, then plugging into our Fermi-Dirac distribution function, 1 over 1 plus e to the epsilon minus mu over kT, we would end up with 1 over 1 plus e to the minus 100 power. Now, e to the minus 100 power is a tiny little number in comparison to the 1, which is on the bottom of that fraction. So that means that basically we end up with 1 over 1, which is 1. So what that's telling us is that if you have a low energy state, epsilon is small compared to the chemical potential, and it's cold, right, then basically your, your state is going to be occupied, completely occupied. There will be uh, a particle in that state, okay? Now, if you look at a case where epsilon is a lot greater than mu, right, then what you've got there is... Um, the epsilon minus mu, the mu is negligible in comparison to the epsilon in the denominator there. So you end up with 1 over 1 plus e to the epsilon over kt. Now, if epsilon is a lot greater than mu, then epsilon, e to the epsilon over kt is going to be greater than 1. And we can ignore the 1, and then we just end up with 1 over e to the epsilon over kt, and that's e to the minus epsilon over kt. If epsilon is big, <coughs> excuse me, then that's going to be approximately zero. So what that means is that under these conditions, the states are not occupied. There are no particles in that state. Okay, so now let's look at what happens if epsilon is equal to mu. If epsilon is equal to mu, then in this exponent here, you have uh, zero because e to the epsilon minus mu over kt would just be e to the zero, epsilon minus mu is zero. And e to the zero is one. So that means that we have one half for our Fermi-Dirac distribution function. Now that would be true regardless of temperature, which is why on this plot, all of the plots regardless of temperature intersect at uh, epsilon over mu one at the one half point. But there is a difference in what you'd see for the cold case, which I've elaborated on here and is showing sort of the kind of blue-green plot, okay, and a hot case. So what happens in the cold case is that you basically get a step function you um, have the states occupied all the way up to epsilon equal to mu, and then um, once epsilon is greater than mu, then the occupation of the state drops off to zero, so you have that step function. Now, as the temperature grows, what happens is that step function gets rounded off more and more, so you see that for mu over 10, you have this blue curve here where you have a rounded off step function, and then eventually you just have what looks like a decaying exponential as it approaches this yellow curve, okay? So that's what the Fermi-Dirac distribution function looks like um, uh, for various temperatures and for various values of the energy of the state. Okay, we're going to elaborate more on the implications of the Fermi-Dirac distribution and apply it to certain questions in physics in later lectures, but that kind of gets us where we need to be right now. So now let's move on and look at uh, bosons, okay?
So bosons, um, remember they do not obey the Pauli exclusion principle, which means there is no limit on the number of bosons that can occupy a single state. As many as want to, I guess, is the answer to that. So um, we're still going to use the same notation. We're going to find the probability of n, little n, molecules or particles in a single state, okay? Um, and that would be 1 over our grand partition function times our Gibbs factor. And then to find our partition function, our grand partition function, we're going to sum over all of our Gibbs factors. So what that ends up being um, is that the energy of the state will be equal to the number of particles in the state times the energy of a single particle occupying that state. So um, you would have n times epsilon uh, particles or energy for that state. Um, and then, of course, the little n would be here as well. So what we end up with is, in our sum, 1 plus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. That's if uh, one particle occupies it. The 1 is if no particles occupy it. Then you'd have e to the 0. So e to the 0 is 1 plus 1 particle, particle occupying would be e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. Two particles occupying it, it would be plus e to the minus 2 times epsilon minus mu over kt. Three particles occupying it plus e to the minus 3 times epsilon minus mu over kt, and then the sum just continues. It's an infinite sum because it does not obey the Pauli exclusion principle, so there's no restriction. Okay, So this sum would actually run up to however many particles that you have, which could be considered infinite if it's a large system. All right, now what that would be is um, 1 plus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt uh, plus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt squared, because remember that if you multiply in a power, it's the same as squaring it, okay? So then we have the Gibbs factor, 1 plus the Gibbs factor, plus the Gibbs factor squared, plus the Gibbs factor cubed, plus, and then it keeps going, all right? Now, this um, infinite series has a finite sum. Uh, it's a Taylor series expansion, as is shown here. If you have any value, really, x, that has an absolute value between minus 1 and 1, then you can write that 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus so on and so forth is equal to 1 over 1 minus x. Okay, so this infinite series has that finite sum of 1 over 1 minus x. And so that means is that if we let x be our Gibbs factor, okay, then our partition function, grand partition function, would sum to 1 over 1 minus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. Okay, so that's it. All right. So that gives us our partition function for bosons. And now what I'm going to do is use an expression that I derived in an earlier lecture for the average number of particles. So when I derived it, it was the average number of particles for the entire system, n bar, and it's equal to kt over our grand partition function times the partial of z with respect to mu. Okay, So that would be for an entire system. But we, it could also, if we wanted to, uh, give us the average number of particles occupying a state if the grand partition function is the grand partition function for um, the occupation of a single state. So I'm going to apply that here and find that derivative. So our grand partition function funky z is 1 over 1 minus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. And now I'm going to plug that into this expression. So I have kt over funky z times partial with respect to mu of uh, 1 over 1 minus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. And then um, when I take that derivative, of course, this is 1 minus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt to the negative 1 power. So the derivative of something to the negative 1 power would be minus 1 times the thing to the minus 2 power. So that would give us minus kt over funky z times 1 over 1 minus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt quantity squared. And then I would multiply times the derivative of the minus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt part. So that would give me uh, my um, minus 1 over kt, right, because it's a minus there, times e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. Now the minus signs cancel out, the kts cancel out, okay? Um, and then what I can do is express 1 over my partition function, my grand partition function, as 1 minus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. So this thing out front right here is 1 over z. And now I'm uh, carrying through, multiplying through by the, uh, the bracket squared and my Gibbs factor again. 
And then um, what I end up with is this uh, partition function, 1 over my grand partition function up top, canceling out with that same factor, one of them in the bottom of the square. So I end up with, um, sorry, this is kind of hard to see. Let me hit enter here. Oops. Just expand it now. Okay. So I end up with um, e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt over 1 minus e to the minus epsilon minus mu over kt. And then um, if I multiply through by e to the plus epsilon minus mu over kt, then I get a 1 up top. And in my denominator, e to the epsilon minus mu over kt minus 1. So that gives me my um, distribution function for uh, Bose-Einstein statistics. So taking a close look at that distribution function again, 1 over e to the epsilon minus mu over kt minus 1, um, let's look at a plot here. So on this right-hand side is an image uh, of the three distribution functions that we've now discussed so far. The Bose-Einstein is shown in green, the Maxwell-Boltzmann is shown in gray, and the Fermi-Dirac is shown in red. And these are for, you know, reasonable temperatures, okay? Sorry about that. Okay, so as I was saying, here's the um, three distribution functions, and uh, we're going to compare them to each other. But first, let's talk about the Bose-Einstein distribution function specifically. Now, you might notice here that as epsilon approaches mu, um, that that factor in our exponent will go to e to the zero, right? And if it's e to the zero, then that's one, and then you have one over one minus one, and that blows up, okay? So um, the restriction is that epsilon must be greater than mu always for this reason, okay? Now, what's going to happen because they're bosons and because they're not restricted by the Pauli exclusion principle is that as the temperature goes low, all of the particles are going to pack into that lowest possible energy state. Um, so you're going to have a high, high occupation of the low energy state and practically no particles in higher energy state as T approaches absolute zero, okay? Um, so you can see kind of um, that behavior here in this green curve. Um, you've got that hard wall sort of asymptotic approach towards epsilon over mu or epsilon equaling mu and it blows up there and then it falls off, okay? Now, you can see that these three distribution functions, first of all, I want to point out that as um, epsilon minus mu over kt grows um, and goes to the right side of our curve here, that we get a really good agreement uh, of our distribution functions. They all start to lie on top of one another. And that kind of makes sense. Um, quantum part particles start to behave classically as those energies get large, okay? And it's only as the energies go down to smaller values that you start to see a difference in their behavior. And that difference is pretty marked. You can see that the um, Fermi-Dirac distribution in particular is behaving very differently from the uh, Bose-Einstein distribution and the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. You do have a little bit better agreement between the Bose-Einstein and the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution um, for a while, but then the behavior does deviate as epsilon minus mu over kt uh, goes smaller. Okay. All right, um, that kind of summarizes the introduction to what the distribution functions for um, bosons and fermions are. And we're going to then use these expressions in later lectures and study particular phenomena in physics, such as, um, for example, conduction electrons. Uh, that's a main application for fermions that we're going to study. And then, of course, Bose-Einstein condensates um, and the behavior of uh, helium at low temperatures uh, can be explored through the Bose-Einstein distribution. All right. Um, I hope you enjoyed that and understood it, and I'll see you in class.